be looking at water resources. Now I'm going to split this discussion into two major parts. For the first half, we're going to look at the science of water. We're going to look at the chemistry of a water molecule. Uh, we're going to revisit the hydrologic cycle. And then we're going to talk about our, our two major components, subsurface water or groundwater and surficial water. We're going to look at streams and we're going to look at the, the major hazard associated with streams flooding. The second half of this discussion, we're then going to take a look at uh, water uses, or in the case, water misuse, uh, especially in the U.S., and we're going to look at some of the major problems facing us today. And so I want to begin by looking at the chemistry of a water molecule. Um, water is what is called a polar covalent molecule. Now, remind yourself of what a covalent chemical bond is. It's the sharing of electrons. So in the case of water molecule, the one hydrogen brings one electron to the table and the oxygen brings one electron to the table and they share that pair of electrons. The other hydrogen brings one electron to the table and the oxygen brings another electron to the table and they share that pair of electrons. That's a covalent bond. Now a polar covalent bond is a bond in which you have an unequal sharing of electrons. What this means is the oxygen is pulling harder on that shared pair of electrons than the hydrogen is. And this creates a oppositely charged poles. So if we take a look at a water molecule, I like to call it the Mickey Mouse molecule, because the oxygen is pulling harder, it creates a partial negative charge on its side and a partial positive charge on the hydrogen side. So when water bonds to itself, and it does, the positive side will attract another negative side. So just like in love, opposites attract. And so water bonds in this long linear fashion. Now all of water's unique properties are a direct result of its polar covalent nature. Now let's take a look at the hydrologic cycle again. Let's revisit it. And let me remind you of the four main processes. We have precipitation the movement of water from the atmosphere down to the Earth's surface in any form. The opposite of this is evaporation, the movement of water from the Earth's surface back into the atmosphere. We had runoff, the movement of water across the Earth's surface, not in channels. And finally, we had infiltration, the movement of water from the surface into the subsurface. This is what creates something that we'll discuss here in a couple minutes called groundwater. Now, I'd like to introduce a fifth process, something called transpiration. Transpiration is the movement of water from the Earth's surface back into the atmosphere if done solely by the action of plants. So remember earlier on in the semester, we talked about photosynthesis, how plants have to absorb sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water, and then they, get, they make their own food and they give off oxygen and water vapor. And so the movement of water from the atmosphere, I'm sorry, from the surface back into the atmosphere if done by plants is called transpiration. Now often what we do is we use the term evapotranspiration. If, and I will use that word later on in this discussion, evapotranspiration are the combined processes of both evaporation and transpiration. It's still the same thing. You're moving it from the Earth's surface into the atmosphere. Transpiration is simply done solely by plants. And this entire process, this entire cycle, remember, is driven by solar radiation, driven by the sun. Now let's take a look at um, our water budget on Earth. 
if we take a look at it, almost 97.5% of the water on Earth are found in our oceans. Salt water, non-potable, non-drinking water. And so we're only left with a little more than 2.5% as fresh water. Of that 2.5%, uh, over three-fourths of it is tied up in ice caps and glaciers. Now, let's look at this from a logical perspective. Would it make economic sense to take a big boat, um, go up to Greenland, chip a big chunk of ice off Greenland, bring it back to the U.S., melt it down for fresh water? No, that doesn't make economic sense. And so really what we're left with is right here, guys, is groundwater. This is going to be the most readily available source of fresh water to us. The other small sliver that you see here, this 0.014% would be everything else. So uh, fresh water found in lakes like the Great Lakes in the upper Midwest, water found in, in soil, in the atmosphere, in rivers, and even in living organisms. Now, I know percentages, sometimes it's hard to visualize that. So let's compress all the water on Earth to 100 liters. So picture 52 liter bottles. I think you can do that. Of those 100 liters, only three is fresh water. So one and a half, two liter bottles are what we have to work with. Of that three liters, only a half a teaspoon is readily available to us. This is why I said on the first lecture when we were talking about renewable and non-renewable natural resources, most people, especially in the U.S., treat water as a renewable natural resource. It's always replenished. That's not really the case, ladies and gentlemen. First off, by how little we start with and the fact that, remember, almost 8 billion of us on the planet require a certain percentage of potable or fresh drinking water every single day. You can go days without food. You can go days without sleep. You cannot go more than 24 hours without fresh water. And so the fact that we start with so little and we consume so much is why I said on the first day that fresh water really should be considered a non-renewable natural resource because simply we use it, we consume it much faster than it can be naturally replaced. And that's a large problem. Anybody that has been to Lake Mead recently knows how serious this problem of overuse is. Now, here are these freshwater resources. So once again, about 75% is stored in glacial ice. The majority is in Antarctica. So the southern hemisphere about 62%, 7% uh, in Greenland, and the other 31% would be our alpine glaciers. These are smaller bodies of ice found at the very tips of tall mountain chains, Himalayas, Alps, Andes, uh, Sierras, Rockies. Now, this is really what we're left with, guys. The number one readily available source is groundwater. And groundwater is stored in something that we're going to look at later on today called aquifers. Now, we also have surface water sources. And if you go back to our um, budget here, the largest um, component is lakes. We also have water in streams, even water in wetlands. For this discussion, we're primarily going to confine our discussion of surficial water sources to streams. Now, let's start by looking at groundwater, the number one readily available source of fresh water on Earth. Now, here's the problem. When most people hear this word, this is what they picture. Water that exists in underground rivers and underground caverns. While technically that is groundwater, the majority of groundwater is here. 
It's the water found in empty or poor spaces between geologic materials, if it's unconsolidated, or water found in cracks and fractures in solidified rocks. Whenever you hear the word groundwater, this is what I want you picturing, not this. Okay? If we look at this, 99% of groundwater is found here, only about 1% would be found in underground rivers and lakes. Now, when it comes to the subsurface, there's two major zones. The first zone is the unsaturated zone. This is the zone that stretches from the Earth's surface down to something called the water table. That's the boundary between the two zones. In the unsaturated zone, the empty spaces are filled with both air and water. Groundwater does not exist in this zone. Any water we found in this zone would be classified as soil moisture. The other zone is the saturated zone. That's the zone that extends below the water table. In this case, the empty spaces are 100% completely filled with water. This is where groundwater resides, in the saturated zone underneath the water table. Now, here's a good visual representation of that. So here are two zones. So once again, the unsaturated zone from the Earth's surface to the water table. Notice how the empty spaces have both water and air. So precipitation falls on the Earth's surface and it infiltrates downward under the influence of gravity. Any water in this zone though, soil moisture. Here's the saturated zone underneath the water table. In this case, 100% of the empty spaces are filled with water. In this case, they're filled with groundwater. Now, let's take a cross-sectional view of a humid environment. So let's uh, imagine that this is the Appalachians out east. Okay. Now you'll notice that here's the what they call the normal water table. So this is where the, the water table normally is during periods of normal precipitation. However, this position of the water table is not static it's dynamic. It can fluctuate up or down depending on the amount of input. So let's say that we have a wet couple of months where we get higher than normal precipitation values. That means we're going to have more infiltration and the water table is going to be found closer to the Earth's surface. It's going to rise. Or let's say now we have three or four months of abnormally dry conditions where we see uh, lower than normal precipitation, in that case the water table is going to drop and it's going to be found um, farther away from the Earth's surface. So don't think of this water table as uh, its position is always constant. It can rise or fall depending on localized uh, essentially precipitation values. Now just like in the case of energy, if we want to get this groundwater out for our use, we drill a well into the saturated zone and we extract the groundwater for our use. Now let's talk about the difference between an aquifer and an aquaclute. And the distinction between these two, it's all about um, economic quantities. So an aquifer is classified as any porous Remember that word pore simply means that it has empty spaces in it. Any porous geologic material that can yield water in economic quantities. Whereas an aquaclude is any porous material that may yield water, but not in economic quantities. That's not a black and white definition here, guys. Let me give you an example of this. Let's say that we have a layer in the subsurface that can yield... 500 gallons per day and we have a single household family residential unit that needs 200 gallons per day and we have a big industrial complex 
that needs 2,000 gallons per day. Okay, so the house needs 200, the industrial complex needs 2,000, and the material can supply 500. In the case of the house, we would classify that geologic material as an aquifer. They need 200, and it can supply 500. That's economic quantities. But in the case of the big industrial complex, they need 2,000, and it can only supply 500. In that case, it would be an aquaclude to them. So the distinction between aquifer and aquaclude is all about how much it can supply. If it can supply you with enough water, it's an aquifer. If it can't, it's an aquaclude. As simple as that. Now, good aquifers are usually composed of sand or sand and gravel materials. Coarser deposits. So, coarser materials usually creates um, more pore spaces, which means it can hold more water. Or, highly fractured sedimentary rocks. Chicago, Illinois sits on top of a highly productive fractured limestone aquifer. Limestone, a sedimentary rock that has been broken, and so you store the water in those breaks or in those fractures. Now, aquacludes, those materials that can't yield economic quantities, they're usually composed of smaller particles. In geology, we call these silts and clays. You might call them mud-sized particles. So smaller particles means we're going to have less pore spaces and they can hold less water. Or igneous, metamorphic, and unfractured sedimentary rocks would generally be considered aquacludes. Now we've talked about igneous and metamorphic rocks in this class. Think about an igneous rock, guys, formed from the cooling and crystallization of, of molten material or magma. As that magma cools, how much empty space do you think an igneous rock has? Zero. And so most of your um, igneous and metamorphic rocks have zero pore spaces, which means it can hold zero water. In that case, we're still going to classify it as an aquaclude because zero is obviously not economic quantities. Now, here's a picture of the major aquifer systems that you find in the U.S. We have the, this eastern, um, we have a northern uh, coastal plain aquifer that progresses into a Mesozoic basin, which in, uh, uh, progresses into a carbonate aquifer here in the east. Um, Florida and parts of Georgia and some of the Carolinas, uh, you have a major aquifer system down here. You have uh, at, from Texas into um, Alabama, another major aquifer system down here. Uh, if you've ever heard of the Ogallala or High Plains aquifer system, this is what stretches from South Dakota into Texas. This has uh, been in the news recently because of overuse. We're starting to see the levels in the Ogallala aquifer decline because we're pumping out more groundwater than can be replenished naturally. Now, of all of these, the most productive aquifer system is this glacial aquifer system in the parts of the upper Midwest, stretching from uh, Texas into Michigan, Minnesota, Indiana, Illinois, um, uh, even into parts of North Dakota and Montana. These deposits were laid down during the last ice age from the movement of glaciers. And so of all of them, that's probably the most productive. Now, if you'll notice everything west of the Rocky Mountains, the aquifer systems are much smaller and disconnected. And so, yeah, you see some aquifer systems up here in uh, Washington and Oregon and in parts of California, Arizona, and Nevada, but they're generally smaller and shallower, which means they're found closer to the Earth's surface, which means it's very easy to contaminate them through human activities. And so generally what we see is the western states, Idaho, 
uh, Utah, Nevada, California, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, we don't have the aquifer systems that they do out east or in the upper Midwest, and so we get most of our fresh water from surficial, process, or for some surficial resources, like in the case here in Nevada, we get 90% of our water from Lake Mead, which is fed by the Colorado. Now, all aquifers are not created equally. Um, some are more productive than others, and that productivity is dependent on porosity and permeability. Porosity is simply a measure of how much void space a geologic material has. The more empty space it has, the more water it can hold. Generally, a high porosity material might have a porosity somewhere between 25 to 35 percent. So 25 to 35 percent of empty space that can, um, where water can be stored. In. Now permeability on the other hand is a measure of how interconnected those pore spaces are. Let me do it, have an example here. Let's say that we have a geologic material that has a million pore spaces but none of them are connected. They're all separate from one another. If we were to drill a well into that material, do you think it would be easy to extract that groundwater? No, because there's no channels or conduits for that groundwater to flow in. So when you think of permeability, think of how easy it is for groundwater to move through. If those pore spaces are all interconnected and if we have conduits, and we start pumping on a well, the groundwater is going to move much easier. That would be a highly permeable aquifer. Now, we would love a high porosity, high permeable aquifer, but generally that's not what reality is going to give us. We might have to make do with a medium porosity or a medium permeability. Now, groundwater doesn't just sit in the subsurface, it's always moving. And that movement is controlled by energy, something called hydraulic head. Now, if you remember your discussion on energy, we actually talked about hydraulic head already when we were talking about hydroelectric energy. And we talked about the energy a hydroelectric power plant can generate is dependent on the difference between the water level behind the dam and the difference in front of the dam. The greater that difference, the greater the hydraulic head and the more energy we can generate. Well, we can also measure the hydraulic head of the groundwater system. All we need to do is drill a well. Once we've drilled the well into the saturated zone, we can measure what the hydraulic head is at that point. We then need to drill a second well into the saturated zone and measure hydraulic head there. As long as we have two points, we can know which way groundwater is flowing because it always flows from areas of high hydraulic head or high energy to areas of low hydraulic head or low energy. The opposite is never true. Just like water doesn't flow uphill, groundwater does not flow from low to high. It's always high to low. So if we have two wells, and one of the wells has a higher hydraulic head than the other, then we know which way groundwater is moving. Now, the more wells we have, the more points of hydraulic head that we have, the more detailed we know what the picture is of how groundwater is moving in the subsurface. So. The minimum we need is two, but the more wells we have, the more points of hydraulic head we have, the better our picture is. Now, that is the subsurface component. Let's now move to the surficial component and talk about streams. We are going to define a stream as any water that has been confined to a channel regardless of its size. Now, generally in this country, we use other terms that generally denote size. Rivers 
are usually large streams. Creeks, or cricks, depending on what part of the U.S. you're from, are small streams. Generally, we try to avoid that confusion, and so instead of using rivers or creeks, we're just going to cause, or we're going to call any water that's con been confined to a channel, regardless of how small or big it is, we're going to call it a stream. Now, this is how we get water in that stream channel. Let's go back to the hydrologic cycle. So, precipitation falls on the Earth's surface. Some of it infiltrates in. Other either evaporates or transpires back into the atmosphere. The other component becomes runoff. And that runoff moves across the Earth's surface, usually flowing from high topographic areas to low topographic areas. As it moves from those high to low areas, if it then flows into a stream channel, it ceases to be runoff and is now part of that stream complex. Now, we can classify streams based on two things. One is seasonal variability, whether a stream um, goes dry for parts of the year, or based on the morphology or shape of the channel. Now let's take that seasonal variability first. Um, we have two types. Intermittent streams are streams, usually smaller in size, that go dry for parts of the year. So they only contain water during the, wet, they're during the wettest months. During the dry months, they go completely dry. Or perennial streams are streams, usually larger in size, that always have water in them. The Colorado is a perennial stream. The Mississippi is a perennial stream. The Nile is a perennial stream. So perennial streams generally always have water in them, no matter what seasonal variability we have. Now, let me give, give you some examples here. You'll notice the top two pictures are pictures taken of the same stream during different parts of the year. On the left hand side you can see the stream channel has water in it. The right hand side it does not. So that's an intermittent stream. Only has water during the wettest months. The bottom two pictures are perennial streams. The picture on the bottom left is the Colorado and the picture on the bottom right is the Mississippi. Perennial streams always have water in them. Now the other way we classify streams is the shape of their channels. The first type are what are called meandering streams. In this case, you have a single loop that curves or meanders across the face of the Earth's surface. Now these typically form in relatively flat areas where the gradient is going to be fairly low. These would be low energy environments. So if you take a look at this top picture, this is a picture taken in West Virginia. Here's a meandering stream where it curves and loops across the face of the earth, relatively flat, relatively low energy environment. Now the other type is a braided stream. This is, instead of one channel, we have multiple channels kind of interwoven into a single larger hole. Now these form in mountainous areas where the slope or the gradient is much higher. In this case, these are going to be higher energy environments. Okay. And so notice this bottom picture here. You have multiple channels, but they're kind of interwoven into this larger hole. Now, once again, steeper slope, higher energy, flat slope, relatively low energy. And so streams can be classified based on seasonal variability, intermittent versus perennial, or morphology, meandering versus braided. Now, when we talk about stream characteristics, there's a couple characteristics I want to go over with you. And the first one, I think I just mentioned a couple minutes ago, was a stream's gradient. 
This is its slope. Or essentially, when I think of gradient, I like to think of rise over run. So it's the vertical drop in elevation that that stream undergoes as it's flowing down slope divided by the horizontal run of the actual stream channel. So if we take a look at this picture right down here, here's a cross-sectional view. Um, this is where the stream originates, often called the source, and this is where the stream would empty into sea level or into large lakes called the mouth. So the rise would simply be this vertical distance from here to here. So here to here, that's the rise. And the distance from here to here, that's the run. So usually here in the steeper slope, that would have a higher gradient closer to the source. As you get to the mouth, notice how the gradient decreases. Now, gradient has a big impact on energy. The greater the gradient, the more energy of a stream channel. The lower the gradient, the less energy a stream has. The other characteristic I want to bring up is something called the drainage basin. I think your book calls it the watershed. I prefer the term drainage basin. So we have two stream channels here that are separated by a ridge or a topographic high. Now any water that falls on this kind of puke green side is going to flow into this channel and be discharged here. Whereas any water that falls on the brown side is going to flow into this channel and be discharged here. Okay, Water doesn't flow uphill and hop the ridge. So all of this area surrounding this stream would be its drainage basin. It's the area that surrounds the stream that contributes water to that stream. So here's this stream's drainage basin, and here's this stream's drainage basin. So it's the area directly surrounding the stream channel that contributes water to that stream channel. Now, you can think of drainage basin on different scales. And so let's take a look at the Mississippi River drainage basin. And first, let's look at it from a macro or a large scale. So everywhere that you see here in green is water that falls on the Earth's surface will eventually make it into the Mississippi River and be discharged in the Gulf of Mexico. That's large scale. But we can also look at it here kind of medium scale because the Mississippi River is actually fed by different smaller streams, the Ohio, the Tennessee, the Missouri, and the Arkansas. They each have their own drainage basin. So here in blue is the Arkansas, light green is the Missouri, orange is the Ohio, and darker green is the Tennessee. So this is what it looks like middle scale. Now, we're going to take a look at this tributary here. And a tributary is simply a small stream that feeds into a larger one. It has its own drainage basin. So you can see that when we talk about drainage basins, you can look at it large scale, medium scale, or even small scale. But it doesn't change what it is. The area surrounding a stream channel that contributes water to that stream. Now, let's move on and talk about stream processes. Now, there are three processes that are simultaneously occurring in a stream channel. Erosion, transportation, and deposition. Now, erosion is simply the physical removal of rock particles. So let's picture a grain of sand is sitting somewhere. And let's say a moving stream plucks that sand particle up and moves it downstream. Okay? The plucking or the removal of that particle, that's erosion. Now, that sand particle, as it moves downstream, that's transportation. So the particles are moved downstream by the action of the moving water. Now when we talk about transportation, 
we talk about a stream's load. This is the amount of material that a stream carries. The greater the load, the more material it carries. Now, we can actually see this. If you've ever seen a stream that looks murky, kind of muddy, that means that that has a great load. It's carrying a lot of material. Whereas other stream channels may be crystal clear and you can see all the way to the bottom. That would be a stream that has a smaller load. So the murkiness of a stream is its load, how much material it's carrying or how much material it's transporting. Our last process is deposition. This is when transportation ceases and the particle settles to the bottom of the stream channel. Generally, in order for a stream to deposit material, it has to lose energy. And this is either usually accomplished by decreasing the stream's velocity or decreasing its gradient. Both of those cases will cause the material that was once being transported to settle to the bottom to be deposited. Now the thing, the important thing to realize here is that all three processes are occurring simultaneously in different parts of the stream channel. So in some parts of the channel where the energy is high, erosion is going to be the primary process. Okay, The middle parts of that channel, that's where transportation is going to occur where we're moving those particles. And downstream, as the slope or the velocity is decreasing before a channel, let's say, flows into the river, deposition is going to be the dominant process. So all three processes occur simultaneously somewhere in a stream channel. Now, if we want to know which process is occurring where, we use something called Hillstrom's diagram. What this is, is a plot of the velocity of the stream here on the y-axis and the particle size on the x-axis. So let's say that we have a particle size of two millimeters and we know the velocity is 10 centimeters per second. We go over here, we go down, that would be deposition. Okay. If we had smaller particles, 1, 256, and we had a flow velocity of 10 centimeters per second, that would be here, that would be erosion would be occurring. So if we plot velocity versus particle size, we can figure out in what part of the channel is erosion occurring, what part is transportation occurring, and what part deposition is occurring. Now, here's the main hazard when it comes to streams. Flooding. This is simply when the water that is in the stream channel is greater than what the channel can hold. And so the additional water will flow out of the channel onto the flat area directly adjacent to the channel called the floodplain. It tells you what it is in its title. It's a plane that periodically floods. Now, this should surprise no one. The severity of flooding is often made worse by human activities. And there's two ways that we can make floods worse. The first one is simply through the process of increased urbanization. So by building bigger cities with more impermeable surfaces, more roads, more parking lots, more buildings, what this does is it decreases the infiltration rate and increases the runoff. Now, that runoff, that excess runoff, is eventually going to make its way into our stream channels, which is going to create bigger, more intense floods. The other way that we make floods worse is by trying to control flooding by building structural controls. And the two big ones here um, are the artificial structures, either building floodwater dams or levees. And we'll take a look at what these are here in a couple minutes. 
or through an approach called channelization where we try to control where the stream flows so instead of a flow instead of a uh, stream flowing in its normal channel we build these concrete structures and we force the stream to flow where we want it to and we'll talk about how that makes floods worse but it often does now first let's take a look at our floodplain so this would be classified as a meandering stream guys notice the flat areas adjacent to the channel these are our flood plains. so when the channel holds all the water that it can and we put more water in it it's simply natural for the water then to move out onto these flat areas where it then can either evaporate infiltrate uh, or be used by plants now the problem with this and you can see in this picture guys we often will build roads or artificial structures on these flood plains, and that's why we have to build levees or or these dams is because we don't want these natural floods to occur flood is a natural process but when we stupidly moronically build structures on flood plains, then we have to do things to prevent floods which often make the floods worse now here is the US flood risk and as you might imagine guys um, so pretty much the entire Mississippi uh, drainage basin we have a high risk so fairly high risk uh, Minnesota the Dakotas Iowa into Illinois um, so the high but we also pretty much east of the Rockies guys you either have a high or above average risk of flood out here in the arid southwest because first off we don't have a lot of precipitation as one of them we have below average risk of floods so east of the Rocky Mountains much higher risk west of the Rocky Mountains much lower risk of floods now let's talk about this urbanization process and how it makes floods worse so first let's take a natural ecosystem without any human interference so in this case half of the water that falls on the ground surface in the form of precipitation actually infiltrates in 40 percent either evaporates or is transpired remember evapotranspiration are the combined processes of evaporation and transpiration and only 10 percent becomes runoff that's a natural ecosystem now let's take a, a rural setting where we built some roads some buildings but not a lot in this case we're talking 10 to 20 percent impermeable surfaces infiltration drops to 40 percent evapotranspiration stays the same but runoff doubles and so that excess 10 percent now is what's going to make it into our stream channels and make bigger larger more destructive floods uh, here's 35 to 50 percent impermeable surfaces so these would be smaller cities infiltration drops to 35 percent evapotranspiration slightly drops to 35 percent and runoff is 30 so we've tripled what the original runoff was and remember the higher this number is the more water goes into our stream channel now let's take a look at Las Vegas here guys 75 to 100 percent impermeable surfaces in this case the infiltration is only 15 percent 50 to 15 think about the strip all the the roads the parking lots the buildings all that creates runoff uh, evapotranspiration drops there's less plants um, so probably most of that is evaporation and now we have 55 percent runoff so we've gone from 10 in a normal environment to 55 and so that is simply how urbanization creates these larger more intense more destructive flood events now here is this structural control so let's talk about levees first levee is a natural or artificial embankment on both sides of a channel designed to prevent overflow 
So take a look at this picture here, ladies and gentlemen. Here's the stream channel, these raised walls here, and in this picture, here's the levee right here. So here's the stream channel, here's the levee, and here's a bunch of dumbasses that built on the floodplain. That's why we have to build these levees in the first place. Now, you have to remember, guys, um, that a stream is constantly eroding, transporting, and depositing over time. So a stream channel doesn't stay in the same place. It moves back and forth across its floodplain. Because once again, it's eroding, transporting, and depositing. We build these levees or we perform channelization because we don't want the channel to go back and forth on the floodplain because we build cities or we build roads here. And that's the main thing. We're interfering with a natural process. Floods are natural. They're supposed to happen when precipitation increases, but by building these things, we often make them worse. Now this picture over here shows the lower Mississippi River. Uh, each of these red lines is a levee that was built and is maintained by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which by the way, spends tens of millions of dollars every year maintaining these things. And since we've been building and maintaining these levees, they often make floods worse because now the channel can hold more water. So instead of flooding here at natural, the, the channel can hold more water so that if the levee breaks, and they often do, will create these larger, more intense floods because of these breached levees. And so you can see uh, in these, both of these were in rural areas. Here's where the levee used to be. Okay, so the channel was here, and so now you can see the floodplain has been flooded. Here's another rural setting where the levee broke. In this case, more urban setting where levee breached create flooding. This was a picture taken after a Hurricane Katrina. Remember, it wasn't the hurricane itself that caused most of the flooding in New Orleans. It was the broken levees because of the wind speed and the intensity of the precipitation they simply couldn't contain all of that water. And so levees, something that we build to create smaller, less destructive floods have done the opposite, guys. Created larger, more intense flood events. The other thing that we do is this channelization, where instead of the river flowing in its own channel, we make these concrete flumes, these concrete channels, and we force the river to flow where we want it to. Now, here's the problem with that, guys. Remember, naturally up and down a, the stream's channel, we're eroding, depositing, and transporting material. Well, with these concrete streams, that we're no longer eroding, transporting, and depositing, so the energy of the streams usually increases. Faster velocities, more um, higher energy, and when they do flood, and they will, we have these larger, more intense floods. Here's a, a statistic that, that I love to look at. So since we've been using this process of channelization, the Mississippi River has had more large floods, not less. The whole purpose of these things, levees, flood dams, and channelizations, was designed to produce less large-scale floods, it's done the exact opposite. So it's not working. We're interfering with these natural processes. We're essentially taking on Mother Nature, guys. And we know that's never going to end well for us. And you can see the statistics back that up. We still build levees. We still cha channelize these streams, even though we know it's having the opposite effect. Now, that was the first half of this discussion, kind of looking at the science of this. The second half, we're going to look at water use.